verses 3 and 4. And he put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Now verses 3 and 4 there, I put them together with, with the comments. Uh, this, uh, Blessed is the man that maketh his trust in the Lord, respecteth not the proud, no, such as turn aside the lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and any thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now, David's testimony cause many people to believe. Many people. Now, I realize that he's in the Old Testament era and the uh, salvation was to the Jews because it was through the Jewish nation that the Messiah was, was to come and did come. But people who were not part of the Jewish nation were proselytes you know, uh, the heathen or uh, the Gentile could come in and worship with the Jews that couldn't come into the tabernacle or the temple for, you know, so many generations and such and such and such. But, but yet they could still believe. And when they watched David's life, uh, watched his testimony, watched how God did things for him, than that he was a testimony. I have my testimony, and you have yours. And we should never be ashamed to tell our testimony, neither should we resent the testimony of others. Amen. If somebody has been through a miry clay, and I understand, I understand there's things that you've gotten into uh, we, you know that I say you uh, there's things that people can get into in their lives that you don't get up and just spell out everything and become a total embarrassment to some of the things that we you know could have gotten into but on the other hand on the other hand we don't need to resent what somebody else where God has brought somebody from oh, do we oh, and, and so uh don't be ashamed of your testimony. But there's a right way and a wrong way to bring it out. Don't you believe? Don't you, don't you believe? And if somebody has been through a terrible thing, whether we believe it or not, it's their testimony. You know. Uh, but one way, let's look at verse 5, last part. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. One way we can worship one way we can worship. Now, I like to worship. I like to feel the presence of God. I like to dance and shout when the Spirit moves. I like the way the Spirit moved that we worshiped here Wednesday night. Amen. Yes, right. It was a quiet spirit, yeah. but it settled down upon us. Yes. Right. And uh, anytime I can worship and shed tears and weep and cry, I'm telling you, that, that, that's that's... I enjoy that as good as I do any other way of worship. But one way we can worship is sitting out quietly in the presence of God and recall the countless blessings that we receive from Him. Now, if we will allow the enemy, rather than to sit down and start counting 
those blessings and just reflect back upon the blessings, he'll start throwing up this, this, this. We won't be thinking about good things. We'll start thinking about bad things. This one done this to me. And I realize I shouldn't have said this, but if this hadn't have been done, start justifying what we do and how we did it and so on and so forth. We're not going to work, get in a spirit of worship like that. You're never going. Uh, uh, Paul said to, to, to the Philippians, and, and he had a big list of things to think on. Think on these things. Sit down quietly and begin to worship. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then I said, then said I, lo, I, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I will delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is written within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest. Now, it's not the sacrifices that God's after. God's after me and you. I can sacrifice, you know, I don't, we don't go back and sacrifice animals and things like that. That's all been nailed to the cross. But we can sacrifice our time. We can get so busy with the religious work, we forget why we're doing it. Amen. Amen. And we can sacrifice our money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't like to talk about money much. In church, people are going to give what they're going to give. And if you start twisting arms and such and such and such, then uh, uh, when they give more than they can, then they're going to resent the church because they do it without. Yep. Amen. So I just don't like going that route. People are going to give what they're going to give. I can tell you what the Bible says, and then after that, it's up to, it's up to the individual. That's all we can do. But uh, but we can give until we don't have any money left to give. And that's not going to get you one bit closer to God. Amen. Not one bit. I talk about money. I remember several years ago, we were in this building over here, and there was a homecoming service uh, around in the area, and they made up close to $20,000 one Sunday in pledges. And some of the folks came back to church and they was telling me, my, we need to have a fundraising day like they did. I said, okay, let's stop to think for a minute. That's one day a year that they'll make up pledges and they got the whole year to, to pay their pledge. I said, we've done that over here in time past. And you're going to have $10,000 per se, and pledges come in. And I know I'm leaving my text, but I just thought I'd throw that in for good measure. <laughs> You're going to have $10,000 in pledges come in. 25% of that money will never show up. It'll be pledged, but it'll never be given. And I said, so we don't just sit one day aside for pledges anymore. We take up the offering every week. And people put in it weekly that wants to put in the offerings and they pay their tithes if they want to do that. And and then whenever the, the years come, come, I said the year end has come, and we get the f a year end financial report, then that church has got $20,000 in one day, then the Lord's blessed this congregation at that time. I said we, we, we wind up about thirty dollars or $35,000 at the end of the year. We've done it weekly. Nobody's made a pledge openly. It's a pledge each of us have made to God for ourselves. But you can sacrifice and, and, and just go on and give all your money away and it still won't help you get in the presence of the Lord. But uh, as I said, Calvary has taken away the Old Testament sacrifices. 
But I want to mention this to get back in the text. There's two ordinances for the church that we still practice. Baptism and breaking of bread. And we practice back baptism regularly. We don't do the breaking of the bread too often. If you read the book of Acts, they did it regularly. And we don't. Uh, the book of Acts didn't mention the foot portion. They just mentioned the breaking of the bread. Uh, some don't want to do one without the other. And some don't want to do either. But I'm telling you, we need to get the order. Just as much as we believe in water baptism, we ought to also believe in breaking of the bread and practice it. Yes. And pray over it. Do it reverently. But the problem we're having is a lot of people, once they get baptized and they take part of the communion, then they feel like that's the end of their spiritual obligations. And it's not. You can sacrifice and do this. David saw through that. And we ought to be able to see through it. And verses 6 and 7 again. Let's look at it. Let's look at verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Excuse me. But my ears thou hast opened. <clears throat> Burnt offering and, and sin offering hast thou not required. My ears have been opened. If you look at that word open, and, and it's strong for the cordons. And it says to dig out, to evacuate. Now, whenever I get to where I can't hear at all, sometimes I do. Especially if I take my hearing aid out. Some days I can't hear nothing. Huh, huh. And I know Sister Esther's thinking, I wish somebody could dig out and evacuate what's stopping that. <laughs> but for whatever's keeping us from getting in tune with God, from hearing Him, the psalmist said, said he's opened mine ears. And he used that strong word there in Hebrew. He, he dug out, he evacuated some things where I could get in the presence of God, where I could hear what he said to me, where God could get, get it through to me. And, 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 and you know, uh, there, that's a strong word years there. How did this come about? Well, where God opened his ears up that way. Perhaps what he'd seen happen to Saul. There have been many things that happened in his own personal life. Chastisements and various things that God had done in David's life, in his own personal life. When he goes through these and he realizes, hey, God has dealt with you here, with me here. David's with God's dealt with me here. And in doing that, he's opened my ears up to where I can now listen to what he's trying to say to me. Now, many times we go through these mind battles. I do. Do you? You don't have to answer me. We go through these mind battles. It leads into anxiety attacks. <clears throat> Depression. A lot of other issues that we got to deal with. And, but we ought to ask ourselves a little bit so. When I wake up in the middle of the night and my heart, and I know that it's not an irregular heartbeat, I know that I've been woke up during the night with anxiety. Is it gone? I'm trying to open up my ears. Is it God trying to use the excavator to dig into me, to my life and to open me up to where I can hear the voice of God? Right. Is that what's going on? Yep. Now, when I put this les lesson text together, uh, uh, and, and, and I, I'm going to be honest with you, I've been way, 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 way too busy this week. 
And I've been working on it way, way, way before daylight today. And thinking about my own personal experiences. And, uh, you know, how God deals with us. Just like sometimes in dreams, is he trying to open up my ears? Uh, you know, I'm wrestled with this over here. I told Brother Jim for services this morning before we got started. I'm not uh, the best carpenter anyway. And when I'm doing a, a gable angle this way, I don't have a bit of problem figuring out my angle. Now, I, I, I may not do it the way a carpenter does, but I know what I got in my mind going this way. But when the angle goes backwards, I just don't get it. I struggle, I struggle, I struggle. And the night before, I'm, 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 I'm you know, wake up and with an anxiety all over me, and then I pray and I go back to sleep, and I have a dream, and, and uh, this big Hercules giant guy, and he's got his hands on me, and I mean, tell you, I can't get loose from him. And I'm, he's wearing me out all night. Or he's not all night, but it feels like it, you know. And I think I've got to get loose to him. If I can get in that bedroom and I get my hand on that pistol, I'm going to put an end to that burger. And I wrestled him and I wrestled him. And in a few minutes, I got loose. I popped through that bedroom door. When I come out, let me tell you, I got rid of my booger. And I'm, I'm wrestled with that thing over there. You know, God's got a way of opening our ears. Let's listen to him. Let's listen to him. And uh, sometimes we experience these unpleasant things. And when we do, ask ourselves a question. Is God digging? Somebody tell those folks that they're welcome to come out on in here. They just, are they, you want to get them? Okay, 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 okay. All right. All right. Many times... Many times we're going through these things. But uh, let's look at verse 7 again. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. God's word is speaking directly to us every time. And I found this out more this past week than I have in a while. Oh, I know God's word which speaks to me every time I open it up but about certain issues. And then let's look at verse 8. So I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So delighting to be obedient to the will of God is better. And then when we do that, we'll know his law is written in our hearts. We know that. And then let's look at verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Now David preached the righteousness of God because David had seen God's righteousness in his years of hiding from Saul. David has seen God's righteousness whenever he was God was chastising him over his moral failure with Bathsheba. David saw God's righteousness and the, and the uprising of Absalom. But David also saw God's righteousness in his peaceful years after his kingdom was destroyed and after uh, he was gathering the materials to build the temple, he could see the righteousness of God all the way down through his life. And he said, I have not hid, and he said, I have not hid the righteousness in my, within my heart. In other words, I messed up, got it in there and put it in there and kept it. But I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness from thy truth with the great congregation. Loving kindness. God's grace. 
God's unmerited favor toward us. It's one thing to know about that God's gift is always right, but it's another also competent to know that God's grace is toward us. Amen. I think of this a lot of times, and I've been more careful in the last few years than I ever have in my life. But it's easy for us to look at something and say, well, they know better. They know better than to do what they're doing. It's easy to look at somebody's life and say, they know better than to be living like that. And while we're talking about the person and what they're doing, what they know better than to be doing, then we fail to look at the fact that this person has a spiritual problem. That's the reason they're involved in these things. When Jesus met the woman at the well that day, sure he talked to her about the five husbands, wasn't it five husbands that, that she had? And the one that she, the one that she had right then was not even her husband. Sure he addressed that problem. But that woman had a spiritual issue. And while the talk was going on, then she gets to talking about the spiritual issue. The Samaritans worship over here in this mountain, and the Jews worship where they do, and I'm paraphrasing this. But Jesus said the time's coming when those that worship will worship in the spirit and in the truth. Jesus got down to the spiritual matter in this situation. And when this woman got delivered there, we don't know the whole story, the whole entire con a conversation. Wow. But she left there and she went back to the city and she said, you come and see the man that's told me all that I have done. Wow. She got delivered spiritually. Yeah. And by being delivered spiritually, then that caused her to let go of these things. And the reason I said that, we can get so self-righteous and say, but look what that woman's doing. Look what she's doing. Look what this guy's doing over here. Look what our young folks are getting into. They get so self-righteous about pointing out their wrongs rather than seeking God for their spiritual deliverance. When Jesus told his disciples that day, I must needs go through Samaria. He felt the pull, I'm telling you, within his heart that there was somebody coming there that day that needed more than marital counseling. A lot of times people, which counsel is past that. Last time, I'll be honest with you, last time I got a call for counseling, I don't mean to sound crude at all, but number one, I'm not a licensed counselor. And when you get into that, you open yourself wide up to for a lawsuit. And he said, do this, and he said, do that, and we didn't do it, and then uh, we did what he said, and then look where we're at. Mm -hmm. But, and it's not that I can't, won't counsel some folks, but when they won't come to church, they won't listen to the word of God, they won't stay on the altar and they won't get their spiritual situation fixed up. Right. And all the talking and the petting and the carrying on I can do to try to get them back together is just going to explode again. Right. That's true. Right. And so rather than to get them out here and talk to them and try to go through all that racket and what they call it, rick and roll, try to go through all that stuff why don't you get yourselves in church? Why don't you get yourselves on the altar? And when you do that, things are going to fall in this place. No, 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 no. They, they don't want that way. Because they won't sit down for counseling so the man can blame the woman and so the woman can blame the man and try to make you a referee. Jesus didn't get into that. He hit the spiritual problem. And that's what we're going to have to start doing is hit the spiritual problem. I'm going to tell you, the more we self-righteously accuse people for things that they've gotten into, the further you're going to drive them away from the gospel. Amen. I'm saying it, and I'm saying it straight. 
I just don't like to hear it. It really starts causing me to tighten up. And it really does. And uh, we appreciate these just coming in here this morning. It's been a long time. And, uh, but, uh, let's look at verse, verse 10. Uh, we done read verse 10. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. Real quickly as we close this up. Without, withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy love and kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about, or some folks pronounce that compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Now, David sees himself in his sins. He's facing his present troubles. He'd been looking on his past troubles. Now he's facing his present troubles. With not, withhold not thy tender mercies from me. David could see his sins, and his sins have been many. Now, we're talking about a man after God's heart. But he failed God too. He had many, so many sins that we find that he's heart fell. He's heart sick over these things. And and this, let's go ahead and we'll go right on in verse, verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame that say to me, Ah, ah. Let those that seek thee, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinketh upon me, thou art my help and my deliverer, make no tarrying, O oh my God. Now, no matter how clever the counsels were against David, and Ahithophel was a, was a uh, clever counselor, and he turned on David. But God was mighty. And regardless of how strong the adversaries were, God was greater. And David turns from his troubles then, and he begins to magnify God. And I preached on this here back in April, if I'm not mistaken, because I had it in my notes. Uh, David began to magnify God. You can take anything that man has made and you put a magnifying glass to it, magnify it under a microscope, and you're going to find defects, defects in anything man has ever made. But the greater you magnify and look at the things of God, you're not going to find one defect. Not one at all. And the more you put God under a microscope, the more you're going to find perfection. And the more perfection you can find, then the only thing you can do is begin to glorify God. Amen. And that's what happens when we magnify God, God's glorified. Then we talk about the poor and needy. Who else could think of the poor and needy but a merciful God? And that's something to think about. Now, I want you to stay for the worship service. And uh, good to see all of us that have come in. I really believe the Lord's going to help us in this worship service today. I really believe He is. And let's do our best to get in the presence of the Lord.